you know, uh, what makes a scientist who's passionate enough about the subject to remain a scientist all their lives uh, can be some special event. This deserves, in fact, a more careful study than has been made, as far as I know, by educators up to this time. But generally speaking, uh, my impression is that most people become scientists and are devoted to the research part of it, making new discoveries all their lives, their career. Uh, they are turned to that by some early experience. It can be very early in their childhood, or it can be a reinforcing experience during their education in uh, high school, up to high school or even into college. And sometimes it can be quite remarkable. It's uh, what you might call the Eureka event or the epiphany. Um, I remember one famous molecular biologist who was made his career learning how to put DNA molecules together. He was one of the pioneers in it. Confessed to me that really he got into this because when he was a boy, uh, someone gave him an erector set. So he spent a lot of time doing that. And uh, erector set, so it was something he loved doing. And when he saw biology, he thought maybe he could work on molecules like an erector set. Well, he was very successful at it. In my case, uh, I started rather young. I was um, a kid who just loved going outdoors and I loved reading National Geographics and seeing old uh, nature movies and adventure movies. And I just wanted from, from my boyhood, and it deepened as I went into high school, to end up being an explorer somewhere, you know, to go up the Amazon and find new species. And, and these you can call very simple, you know, even childish dreams, but they are what really move us for the rest of our lives. The French philosopher um, Camus put it very well when he said, all of a man, he should say person, man or woman's creative life consist of the search through all the detours and routes of art and thinking to rediscover those images in the presence of which his soul first opened. And it's so frequently the case that what we would like to have is a um, a, re a, a return, a, a reprise, a, a, um, a, an experience like that which so excited us when we were young. I think we don't give the opportunity for many eureka moments to our students. Uh, there are gifted teachers, I think there are certainly in your school, uh, because you've developed uh, an approach and then attracted the kind of outstanding teachers to to achieve it. Uh, but but it's too much uh, running in the traditional education of running through what are considered the essentials of subjects and they have to show a certain knowledge or mastery of it and then they be able to give some of it back. Whereas the best way to teaching, to teach, is to have students uh, to encourage their eureka moments, to bring them close enough to the way scientists actually work and experience nature and process that excited them when they were very young, often in a very simple way, creating a lasting passion for it. And I believe that we can teach students in a manner now in which they are engaged in the discovery process. They can duplicate the way great discoveries were made. They can even help. As for example, I know you've done in the case of uh, biodiversity of San Diego, the area, sure. actually go out and make original discoveries that are scientific discoveries. At the very least now, with the new Encyclopedia of Life, which is accumulating all knowledge about all species, it's possible for a beginning student to actually go out and find a, a kind of a snake somewhere or a snail or a fish and, and in a place where it hasn't been discovered before and adding to the knowledge about the occurrence of that species, the geographic location and, and the 
environment where it was founded. And by golly, that can be vetted by an expert. And that student, right from the beginning, has made an important discovery. And I can well imagine at your high school, for example, high tech high school, the student having done that much then is encouraged to go on. Hey, pick up. Why don't you do a broader scientific knowledge uh, exp uh, study of this? And oh, oh, why don't you talk to the to the uh, to your fellow science students about just exactly what you're doing here? Okay. And okay. that duplicates the experience of real scholarship, of real scientific studies as we do it all our lives. I uh, was in despair, I've been in despair a lot, you know, about public awareness on the living environment and conservation. And um, so uh, in the early 80s, 1980s, um, 25 years ago, uh, I said, oh, well now, there are two things that I've been very interested in and done science in. One is human nature and human instinct, you know, and what it is that humans want and care about, especially with the environment, right? But the other thing I was been so interested in is the disappearance of so much of variety of life. And I, I was particularly uh, concerned that so few people were paying attention. They still too many, a few people are paying attention you know, to the extinction of species and ecosystems. And I said, why is it the only people care, uh, who care about it are just a small number of environmental people and scientists about the living environment? And then I said, well, we all love it. <clears throat> we all love all this life. And, and uh, polls have shown that 80% uh, of Americans uh, if they're asked about it and they know what you're talking about, they want to save it. And they will, will even amazingly put, uh, be, uh, tolerate a rise in taxes uh, to take care of the rest of life. That's amazing in the United States. And I said, Let's, how can we put these things together? Well, why not introduce the love of life, biophilia, I called it, to um, uh, put it in as a, a, a science? you know, to study and call attention to it as something that's very real and one more reason to uh, try to save the rest of life. Up to that time, we'd been mainly saying things like, well, you know, we depend on it for our water supply and we depend on it for new medicines and so on. But why not take the most basic reason, which is that we are so thoroughly linked psychologically and love life so much in its all its forms. Why don't I take that as an even more basic moral issue? Well, biophilia, <clears throat> I think it's taken hold. Of, uh, it's a scientific subject now. And uh, it's, uh, I think, more and more appreciated that we have a, uh, a moral, a built-in, hardwired moral propensity to take care of it. And I'll use the word spiritual. That is, you know, it's important for the human heart, for the human spirit. For more information, visit hitechhigh.org.